This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. This is a show where the news is not made up and we don't have points so they don't matter. Here's what we got for y'all. Former President Donald Trump is a central figure for many supporters of the QAnon conspiracy theory. But with him out of office, what's next for the people who believe he was meant to hold shady politicians accountable? Plus, deep fakes have gotten pretty convincing and now the Pentagon wants to do something about that. But first, here's what you need to know right now. The first cases of an even more contagious COVID variant were confirmed in the US today. Two different people with no travel history tested positive in South Carolina, meaning community transmission is already likely. We know this strain first found in South Africa is up to 50% more contagious, which creates concerns for a renewed spike in cases. Experts still don't know if the variant is more deadly. Now, we try to balance the bad news with the good news here. So preliminary studies show Pfizer and BioNTech's COVID vaccine is still effective against lab-made coronaviruses, similar to UK and South Africa variants. There were small differences in how it performed, but researchers say it's unlikely to significantly decrease the effectiveness to try and get ahead of variants, Pfizer is also working on a booster shot. So what does this mean for your daily life? Basically, any high-risk activity you're doing might be a bit riskier. Some guidance from doctors to help keep you safe. When you can, get that curbside pickup or delivery for groceries and avoid spending time indoors with people not in your household. And consider doubling up on those masks, which means if you are still wearing a neck gaiter or a bandana, it's time to seriously up your game. If you haven't at least tried to understand the stock markets this week, I don't blame you, it's complicated. But here's what we do know. On Thursday, brokers placed restrictions on certain trades, causing some stocks that were soaring earlier this week to fall dramatically. This week, Wall Street's volatility index, also known as the fear gauge, which is horrifying, jumped 62%, its biggest rise in two years. We know that was largely driven by this Reddit forum, which ignited frenzied buying into heavily shorted stocks. Now the SEC says it's monitoring the situation, but is there anything illegal going on? Here's what the founder of the Reddit forum behind the craze told CNN. Here, what we're seeing is kind of this collision between uh, a system which is clearly not behaving the way it should be behaving, yet nobody's prepared to handle it on the regulatory side, the government side, or, or on the actual uh, forum itself. And while that is true, there are some broader concerns around how long this will last. This is the most significant instance of small time individual investors coming together to actually make hedge funds shake and make some money doing it. But the man who inspired Wolf of Wall Street, who was also found guilty of stock manipulation, says it's not likely to last. It's truly, it's like a modified pump and dump because at the end of the day, it will uh, most certainly go back down because it's not trading based on any rational fundamental value. Pregnant women should not take the Moderna or Pfizer vaccines for COVID-19. That's according to new recommendations from the World Health Organization. It largely has to do with the fact that neither trial actually tested the vaccine on pregnant women. So we don't know that it's harmful to pregnancies, but we also don't know that it's harmless. Does that make sense? Moderna plans to study pregnancy outcomes in mothers and infants. Pfizer says it's also working towards starting a maternal vaccine study. Both vaccines are made using mRNA technology. According to the World Health Organization, developmental and reproductive toxicology studies in animals haven't shown any harmful effects. The WHO said there is an exception for any pregnant women who might be at high risk of a severe case or a high risk of exposure. Former President Donald Trump, a central figure in QAnon, has been out of office for more than a week. Now some are asking what happens to QAnon without him in the White House and in a position of power to hold Satan-worshipping, child sex trafficking, deep state saboteurs accountable. Newsy's Tyler Atkinson takes us a little further down that rabbit hole. Many QAnon followers lost faith in the baseless conspiracy theory when former President Donald Trump, a central figure in the QAnon world, left the White House. But not everybody. According to the QAnon prophecy, the inauguration was supposed to be the day that Trump would arrest Democrats and celebrities for running a global child sex trafficking ring and remain in office for a second term. So help you God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. <laughs> 
Inauguration Day also came as social media companies expanded efforts to purge QAnon from their platforms. Twitter recently removed 70,000 accounts for pushing QAnon content. Facebook took down more than 45,000 Facebook and Instagram accounts as of early January. On top of that, Q, the person or persons behind the QAnon theories, has largely gone silent since Election Day. Whoever Q is has only posted four times since the election, the last time in December. I'm convinced that this movement will continue for some time to come, uh, because, uh, forming around other personalities, but having similar themes, being anti-democratic, uh, you know, being authoritarian, uh, you know, thinking that violence is acceptable. QAnon's not just a conspiracy theory, and it's not just that people believe in it, it's a community. The community has uh, well-developed lines of communication. There's identified leaders. There are people that can be looked to to provide some guidance. QAnon is really invested in this thing called the plan, and they have to trust the plan. And that's a faith-based uh, uh, moment. So prophecies can can be given. They can also fail. Um, and so the failure of the, of the prophecy doesn't mean the failure of the entire movement. It means um, regather and figure out the next thing. So the goalposts keep shifting. It's difficult to predict exactly what might happen to the QAnon theory, but there are a few possible pathways for followers. For the hardcore, uh, it's it, this is just, as even Trump himself has said, and, and their promoters have said, this is the beginning, right? So, so, so they will continue to follow him, even if he's um, doing it from other places and through other communication channels. They still see him as their leader. Some QAnon followers have moved to harder to find social platforms like Telegram and Gab to keep the movement alive. And there, they might start following groups with similar extremist ideologies white nationalists are on those platforms, like national socialists are on those platforms, and they are working as hard as they can to like spread their message, you know? And unfortunately their message is like very much in line with QAnon's message, you know? It's against the government. They want, they want a, a civil war, <laughs> you know? They want violence to be acceptable. Uh, you know, they want to live in like, you know, a conspiratorial reality as opposed to a fact-based reality. For instance, one of the latest QAnon claims borrows from the Sovereign Citizen Movement, a group viewed by law enforcement as a top domestic terrorist threat. Sovereign citizens believe that an act by Congress in 1871 did away with the U.S. government and installed a corporation in its place. QAnon groups on Gab and Telegram have been sharing documents explaining the act, saying it proves that Trump will be sworn in on March 4th, the original start date of the new U.S. president, until it was changed changed in 1933. For some, he is he is going to be the president of the proper American Republic, whereas Joe Biden is the president of some fake America, right? So they created this world in which Trump is still a, a, a leader. Experts think that QAnon is likely to keep mutating, in part because followers still have access to online meeting grounds and because of the alternate and ever-changing reality that QAnon presents to its followers. Taking QAnon off a platform does not put out the QAnon fire off a mainstream platform like Facebook or Twitter, but it does reduce access to fuel. So maybe a fire won't turn into a massive blaze that engulfs acres of land. There are these common themes that conspiracy theorists seek to kind of renew as new events uh, occur. And at the same time, there are disparate domains that kind of reinforce already existing notions. It's like QAnon is tied to, at any moment, five or six different conspiracy theories. Tyler Adkisson, Newsy, Chicago. COVID vaccine deliveries and video games. It's a crossover you didn't see coming. As it turns out, you can gamify anything, even one of the most crucial parts of the vaccine distribution process, the delivery. We're going all gas, no breaks into the world of gaming with one of our favorite segments, Next Level Speed Run, starting with this. The coronavirus vaccine seems to have sparked a fierce controversy in the world of digital truck driving. Is nothing sacred? Right now, popular trucker games, yes, those exist, including American Truck Simulator and Euro Truck Simulator 2, are hosting special in-game events challenging players to safely deliver truckloads of coronavirus vaccines. Cute idea, right? Well, apparently the event prompted some pushback from some anti-vax players. Publisher SCS Software later came out with a statement, which said the event 
wasn't meant to take a stand for or against vaccines, which also upset people. The company later clarified they stand behind science and sound research. The vaccine event is planned to run until February 7th, after which presumably the virtual world will have to figure out vaccine logistics on its own. As the Reddit versus Wall Street stock market drama continues to explode, it's worth asking, why GameStop? How did this one company spark a war waged through stocks? Short sellers went all in against GameStop because on paper, it's the perfect company to bet against. The game retailer was struggling to compete even before COVID hit. Its brick and mortar approach fared poorly against the likes of Amazon and digital only storefronts like Steam. But the Wall Street Bet subreddit has a soft spot for the video game store and latched onto a few dissenting voices who thought the stock could be more valuable than the street says it is. Most recently, activist investor Ryan Cohen and his plan to turn the business around. There's a lot more going on here as well. Anti-establishment sentiment and sheer trolling for starters. But there's just something incredibly Reddit about waging a stock market revolution on the back of a venerable gaming brand like GameStop. This week in Cyberpunk 2077 news, developers CD Projekt Red have drawn a line with their community. Do not do anything inappropriate with Keanu Reeves. Keanu appears as a non-playable character in the much maligned game. Now Cyberpunk's developers have taken down a fan-made modification to the game, which superimposed the actor's in-game character, Johnny Silverhand, over one of the game's many sex scenes. Unofficial game mods are actually often encouraged by PC developers. The this just lets users add new content or tweak the game experience. Now, for the record, Cyberpunk 2077 does have sex scenes involving Keanu's character, but they're all from his character's perspective. In this case, CD Projekt Red said it removed the mod because it might have been perceived as harmful to the real life actor, which, yeah, understandable. Y'all been watching Lupin? I have, and as fun as it is, I haven't yet learned French which is lame. In the show, there's a reference to deep fakes or manipulated videos that makes it look like somebody's saying something they actually aren't saying. As a part of National News Literacy Week, we are looking at different types of misinformation. Newsy's Patrick Terpster explains that deep fakes are getting more believable and the Pentagon wants to do something about that. Lyrics coming at you with supersonic speed. From Queen Elizabeth rapping. Why vote for me? To Tom Cruise running for office. This is no stunt. Deep fake videos can be harmless fun. Special effects to make anyone seem to be saying anything you want. Like supercalifragilisticexpedocious. Manipulated videos can also be dangerous. A form of propaganda or misinformation. A national threat when you can believably control the words of world leaders. These videos and this technology have the potential to truly be a weapon for our adversaries. So the Defense Department has been funding work of engineers such as Siwei Lu at the University of Buffalo in a high-tech arms race to outsmart media manipulators. This line of work is like a cat and mouse game. The Pentagon's goal? Build a platform able to instantly and forensically analyze videos for the subtle hallmarks of a faker's handiwork things you can spot. Doctored videos often rely on images found online, and those aren't likely to include pictures of someone blinking. Most of the time, when we see somebody close the eyes, it's not a great photograph. Algorithms also compare slight differences in movement between a head and altered face, and how light reflects in a person's eyes. In a real image, light will bounce back the same in each eye, not so for a lot of deep fakes. And you see that they are very different. Media manipulation is getting better, more believable. Take a good look at these faces. They're all computer made. But they're all fake. They're, it doesn't correspond to any real human on Earth. Developers are working on a way to embed authentication codes in media, like a blue check on Twitter or watermark on a $100 bill. If it's a video of me talking to you, nobody cares, right? It's not a big deal. Uh, but if it's a video captured by uh, law enforcement using a body camera, we care. People's lives matter based on that video. But even a low-tech forgery, a shallow fake, can be convincing. I'm sorry, to do what? Somebody slowed down a video of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to make it appear she was slurring her words. Not a deep fake, a cheap fake. One still viewed millions of times. When uh, Peter 
at that shiny gate. Lou says, like with the pandemic, our own behavior can help stop the spread of falsified media. Use trusted sources, he says, to verify videos before sharing them. We need to be very careful about what we're seeing, what we're hearing. A whole new world. Learn to not always believe your own eyes. Patrick Terpstra, Newsy, Washington. I feel like I just got some inspiration on how to go on vacation without going on vacation, if you catch my drift. This week, we've talked a lot about President Biden's flurry of executive orders in his first week in office. One of the next things on his agenda is undoing former President Trump's policy on family separations at the southern border. Newsy's Ben Shamiso explains how Biden plans to address that policy and why lawyers and advocates say there's a tough road ahead in doing so. President Biden has devoted much of his time in office so far to reversing the legacy of Donald Trump. And one of his most challenging items will be reuniting families separated at the border. We have been searching on the ground in Central America for the families without phone numbers, without addresses. More than two years after the controversial Trump policy was banned, over 600 children remain separated from parents who can't be located. President Biden will reportedly create a task force in the coming days to find the missing parents. Advocates welcome any assistance, but they also call on the president to offer legal status to all 5,500 families who suffered the trauma of separation. Guatemalan immigrant Ernesto is one of them. In 2018, immigration officers entered his El Paso detention station and grabbed his 14-year-old son and other kids without any explanation. Soon after, Ernesto was deported while his child remained in the U.S. He asked us not to use his last name. With help from lawyers and advocates, he was able to re-enter the U.S. a year later and reunite with his son. He is now seeking asylum from political persecution. We owe it to these families. They've suffered a terrible, a terrible harm that was inflicted only to cause harm. The Trump administration approved large-scale family separations, including for toddlers, in April 2018 as part of its zero-tolerance policy, prosecuting all undocumented border crossings. Then-President Trump said it would deter illegal immigration. But after images of children locked in detention cages sparked outrage, Trump ended the policy about two months later. A recent government report details how then-Attorney General Jeff Sessions and other officials knew the policy would split up families, and yet implemented it without a thorough plan to reunite them. Better coordination always works. Mike Howell was a Homeland Security official in the Trump administration when the border policy was implemented. He agrees that it needed better planning, but says the parents who crossed the border illegally with their kids are also to blame. There's only one category of people that chose family separation in this country. It's the parents of those illegal aliens. As for families advocates, they would like the Biden administration and Congress to further investigate the origin of the policy so it never happens again. Ben Shamiso, Newsy. If you haven't done so already, feel free to hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. That is the best way to get in touch with me. The worst way, use any of the words I've already muted. Robin Hood, AMC, AMC Entertainment, GME, GameStop, Stocks, Stonks, Stock Market, Stonk Market, etc. I'm going to read you a passage from a 2020 WHO article on HIV and COVID. People living with HIV with advanced disease, those with low CD4 and high viral load, and those who are not taking antiretroviral treatment have an increased risk of infections and related complications in general. Low CD4 and high viral load. What the heck does that even mean? Clear language can help Americans achieve medical literacy but research shows overly complicated language, especially when it comes to COVID, can have a negative impact on some Americans. 
Newsy's Lindsay Thies breaks down how complicated wording can mean gaps and who's more likely to get sick from COVID-19. Fomites, spike protein, viral load. These are some of the medical COVID-19 terms, and for some, they could be hard to immediately understand. It is so important for us to be able to communicate properly. This is the, the most important thing that we need to do. The CDC, American Medical Association, and the National Institutes of Health say public health information should be for a 6th to 8th grade reading level. The 2010 Plain Writing Act requires federal agencies to use clear government communication to the idea is that clear language will help Americans achieve enough medical literacy to be able to make sense of the news and make good decisions for their own health. But research shows state public health and CDC websites are using overly complicated language to talk about COVID-19, and that could be having an impact. Joseph Dexter, a researcher at Dartmouth, co-authored a study which looked at more than 130 state and local federal web pages in the early months of the pandemic. Out of all 50 states, None of them had public information about COVID-19 that was written at an eighth grade le level or lower. Complicated wording can mean gaps in which groups are sickened more by the virus. It also leaves nurses and doctors to combat confusion amongst patients. Now, when you put information like that out, the general public is like, what? Kim Armour is the vice president and chief nurse executive at Northwestern Medicine's Huntley Hospital. She suggests using tools like analogies, pictures, and back and forth conversation to help talk through all the complex topics during this pandemic. Above all, she says, it's about meeting others at their level. When we talk about um, kind of baseline education and reading um, ability, right? Um, that's one small space of saying, okay, could they be able to read at an eighth grade level or for here at our organization, we really focus on the sixth grade level. I will tell you in my doctoral school training, we did all of our work focused on a fourth grade level. It's a lesson for public health officials, a public that is better informed about the basics of a pandemic, make better allies in fighting it. For Newsy, I'm Lindsay Thies. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back next week with more in the loop. Same time, same place. Top stories from Newsy are headed your way right now.